Taphophobia is the name given to the irrational fear of being buried alive. The word deriving from the Greek taphos, meaning grave or tomb, and phobos, meaning fear. In 2022, it is accepted by most this is an irrational fear. Science and medicine has come along far enough to detect even the tiniest signs of life. For most of our history, however, this has not been the case. In 1895, a physician named J.C. Ousley stated his belief that even at the end of the 19th century, 2,700 English and Welsh were prematurely buried each year. Others counted this was an exaggeration. The real figure was only around 800 a year. Only. Of course, for most of our history, life was determined by a heartbeat or signs of breathing on a mirror. As it became possible to restart a stopped heart or lungs, mouth-to-mouth resuscitation first being used on drowning victims in France in 1740, and chest compression in the USA from 1903, People in these states were recategorized, unresponsive. Proof of life focused on brain death, something not defined in a modern sense until 1968. So it shouldn't surprise anyone a great many poor souls were buried prematurely. Nor should it surprise anyone that there are a few horrifying signs of folk who came to while six feet under and who fought desperately to escape their entombment. In July 1661, Lawrence Cawthorn was one such victim. A journeyman butcher working at London's Newgate Market, single and without property, he lived at a Mrs. Cook's boarding house. When Cawthorn fell ill, his landlord contrived to have him declared deceased as soon as possible. For one, his passing would free up a bed for a paying resident. An ailing Cawthorn hadn't paid rent for a few days. Also, with no next of kin, Mrs. Cook would inherit Cawthorn's possessions, but only if he died in her premises. Three days after falling ill, no condensation showing on a looking glass placed under his nose. Cawthorn was pronounced dead and sent to the undertaker. Just as the last sod of earth was placed down, a tortured scream was heard from below. The undertakers dug down as frantically as they could, but it was all in vain. They cracked the coffin lid to find Lawrence Cawthorn had passed. In his panic, he had shredded his funeral shroud and beat his face to a pulp trying to headbutt the coffin open. Alice Blunden of Bassingstoke, buried in 1674, could have been a luckier tale. As it is, I find her story far more disturbing. Having overdosed on poppy water, an opiate developed by the polymath Nicholas Culpepper, Blunden was pronounced deceased, when in fact she was in a deep coma. Two days after her burial, a group of children playing in the graveyard heard her screams. The children didn't tell anyone for a day, finally spilling the beans to their school headmaster, who in turn alerted the undertaker. The undertaker grabbed a spade and dug Blunden out. She was still alive, but in a very bad way. Just as she came to, she collapsed again from the stress of her ordeal, and yet again she was pronounced dead and reburied. Again she came to, her screams alerting locals the following night. However, this time she did pass on. When she was disinterred, a bloodied and bruised Blunden was found inside. I have one final tale to tell you all this episode. Let's discuss Hannah Beswick, a taphophobe from Birchen Bower, Lancashire. Hannah was born to a wealthy family in 1688 and actually had good reason to fear premature burial. When young, her brother John passed, or appeared to have passed on. At his funeral, just prior to the lowering of the top of the coffin, someone noticed John's eyelids were fluttering and called a stop to the burial. 
John was re-examined by the family doctor, Charles White, and declared alive after all. He made a full recovery. This experience left deep emotional scars on Hannah. She insisted that when she passed, efforts must be made to keep her above ground long enough to confirm she really was dead. She approached Dr. White, tasking him to ensure this happened. Hannah passed on in 1758, and White did keep his word. Well, kind of. To preserve her body while out in the open, White, a man with a love of cabinet curiosities, embalmed her. Having mummified her body through an experimental method that he never recorded, but was sure to have killed her had she simply been in a coma, the body was then placed inside the frame of a grandfather clock. Hannah's will made it clear that she was not to be buried until certain she was dead, but one would infer that she was to be buried thereafter. For well over a century, her body would be kept by doctors in Manchester Museum, while family members fought over her will. And Hannah Beswick, the Manchester mummy, would not be declared deceased, finally interred, until 22nd of July, 1868.